<coughs> Evening, everyone. Guess what? We all know, don't you? There's been some breaking news. I'm not going to change the, the general topic of the stream, um, but Nadine Doris has now formally resigned. But more than that, because nothing actually happens till Parliament's back in session. It's like nothing happens. Um, more than that, her letter, if anyone has read it yet, is um, there's some things in there. She's quite off her head. Uh, but I um, haven't had anywhere near enough time to unpick it all yet. So I'm not going to uh, change stream. We're going to I'm going to start off by discussing, as, as I intended to do, the um, the impact, if any, of, of Rishi Sunak this year in terms of getting the Conservatives back being fit uh, to run an election campaign and particularly what he's been doing this summer. Um, but afterwards, once we've gone through a few things, yeah, if you want to talk about the Nadine Doris resignation, absolutely, we can go through a few things. I have quickly read the letter, but this is very much breaking news. It's like in the last hour. Um, it is... It's quite spectacularly hypocritical and deluded at the same time. But anyway... On to the Conservative Party in general. In fact, I've been asked, Uncle Social Just, I will just add this one thing because it's relatively uh, related. Do I think that the Doris resignation today is designed to cause Sunak difficulties ahead of the Tory party conference in September? Looks like the by-election will coincide with this. No, uh, nothing can happen because Parliament's not in session. Um, this resignation, if she was intending to resign at all, I think she probably was, but we can't be sure. It was not now. There's no point in it being now. This has come, it's been quite clear over the last week that there's been a big build-up of pressure from within the Conservative Party for her to go. They're, they're all sick of her. Even people whom she might have considered her allies are sick of her because of the damage it's doing to the party. Uh, and then she writes a letter doing a lot of damage to the party. So no, she's, she's handed this letter in now because of that pressure. She's sick of it. If... The maximum damage would have been, I think, just before the um, they broke up for the conference season. But it, it makes no difference doing it now. It's not helped her. It's not maximum damage to Sunak at all. Uh, and in terms of the process, nothing can happen until Parliament's back in session. It's not in session for another two weeks still. Like I can't remember the exact date. It's about, what is it, the 6th or something of September? So or a week and a half or something to go, something like that, 5th or 6th of September. So nothing, nothing happens until, because you don't just resign as an MP. You have to like be appointed to one of these two sort of positions. It's all really weird. Um, and, it, and it can't happen until Parliament's back. So, But there we go. Right. So let's crack. I want to I want to just point out a few things because. So Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister at the end of last October. So he he sort of thought his first phase of the job was steadying the shit. Obviously, yes, there was a uh, the public had a very dim view of the Conservatives at the time, the last days of the trust of, of the lettuce wars with Liz Truss. So yeah, um, but from the new year, he then decided to announce his well his pledges, but he also announced his general appeal to the public so we've had now um over half a year over half a year since that reset that right we've steadied the ship we've moved on from the liz trust uh, time i was gonna say years there weeks the liz trust weeks um although it did it's taken nadine doris longer to actually resign with immediate effect than it did for liz trust you know that she, She's been resigning for longer than Liz Truss was Prime Minister. Uh, that's how long that is. Um, but let's just have a look what progress, if any, he's made. So I've first of all, I'm going to cite both YouGov and Ipsos Mori here because those are the two pollsters which over the last, certainly the last two general elections, have had pretty good results when you compare them with the actual election results. Um, their methodology is different, but both really good as well. Um, in fact, Ipsos Morris is actually really good because because they don't do online polling. They do very much, not so much face to face, but on the phone polling. They interestingly are the only pollster that doesn't inflate the, the Reform UK vote. 
Uh, but for this, I'm going to just compare Labour and the Conservatives. So they're both fine for that. I think they're both quite good. So this is the situation. Now, I keep sort of pointing out with polling, you know, they can go up and down. You can see them going up and down if you look at a trend time. It's too easy to look at the latest poll results. Go, Oh, Labour have gone up and the Conservatives have gone down or vice versa. And you think, what in the news has done that? And you can fall into traps because it's just the natural variation up and down, up and down, up and down. Um, and I just want to sort of highlight how Rishi Sunak hasn't actually done anything at all. Um, so on January the 5th, this was YouGov's first poll of the year, 2023. Labour were on 46% and Conservatives were on 25%. May the 10th, this is just after the local election. So there's been a big campaign, right? There's been a campaign. Both Labour and the Conservatives have been campaigning. Um, Labour on 43, a bit lower. Uh, Conservatives on 25, exactly the same, right? Uh, the reason why Labour will have been a bit lower then, by the way, and it's the same in any election, it's because at those times the Lib Dems tend to wake up a bit. So the Lib Dem and some other smaller parties as well, but mostly like the Lib Dems will have uh, raised their profile a bit because they will have been very much in the mix there. Um, then what happens as we move on from that campaign period, July the 20th, that was the day of the by-elections, those three by-elections, Labour on 44%, Conservatives 25 So now the latest one, August the 18th, so last week basically, Labour 45, Conservatives 26. So essentially over the course of this year, if you just look at that period of time, that eight-month period of time, it's not changed. You know, the, the lead between Labour and the Conservatives, it varies like one or two, and it's basically the same. So Rishi Sunak hasn't actually improved their poll rating. There was a natural reset after Liz Truss went. Or anyone credible, like you might have even had that if it had been Perry Mordon or probably not Boris Johnson, but... You know, anyone credible had taken over as prime minister when Rishi Sunak did would have had that. Thank God Liz Truss has gone bounce. And that's what he got over the first few weeks since the start of January. He's had absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. And, and just above my head, there's the tracker for best prime minister as well. Keir Starmer consistently ahead of Rishi Sunak. And I'm going to show you something. Before, I'll go through a couple of comments first. Then I'm going to show you some of the latest from Ipsos Mori. So you go produce these things regularly because it's an, it's an online pollster. They can do them quite regularly. Ipsos Mori, because of the nature of the way they do them, they don't do them very often. Um, but they have now just released a load of data, which is quite interesting. So uh, one angry pagan is saying, Tory civil war simmering nicely then, Phil. Potentially, yeah. I mean, what I would say about the Nadine Doris situation, because it is going to have an impact on how the public view the Conservatives. If I were a Conservative, I would be basically saying to Nadine Doris, even if I approved of her, what are you doing? This is attacking the Conservative Party. You know, she's got an axe to grind. She's acting out of spiteful resentment. She thinks she's attacking Rishi Sunak, but she's attacking the Conservative Party. Anyone who wants the Conservatives to win the next election should be as appalled by that letter as I am amused by it. Put it that way. Anyway, Uncle Sushan there. Phil, as for Sunak and his dealing with immigration, it looks like it's another failure of gargantuan proportions. Where does he go from here? Aimlessly. He's been aimless from the start. His plan in January was, oh, I'll announce these pledges. They'll naturally happen anyway. I've, I've made sure that... It's like I, I, I often use the example of like an annual review at work. So, you know, an annual review, often you have to come up with some targets for the following year. And ideally, you pick targets you, you are either naturally going to achieve or ones you've sort of already done and haven't told anyone. I used to do a bit of that. You can't always pick your own. Obviously, your manager's going to pick some as well. But by and large, I used to, wherever I could, because who can be asked with annual reviews? Wherever I could, I would pick something that was just obviously going to happen. Like, if there was a, a change in the curriculum coming up and I had to adapt it, well, of course, I'm going to put that down as a target because I've got to do it anyway. <laughs> Why wouldn't I? Or if, I've, if there's a project I've been working on and I haven't really told anyone I've done it, 
I'll just say, oh, I'm going to do this thing. Oh, that'd be a good idea, Phil. We'll put that down. I've already done it. <laughs> it's like, I've still done the work for it, but I know it's in the bag. That's the point. That's what Rishi Sunak did. He, he, he made five pledges that he thought were just going to happen. How he thought they were going to happen is anyone's guess. Um, and, and, but that was it. He just thought he was going to con the public by announcing that he was going to do things that... Would, and it's not working as well. Like, I don't know whether people have noticed. I'm going to do a video on this as well. Like, there's multiple videos now for me to do. Uh, it's all, it's all hit, hot, hotting up again. But Labour are now going to attack Rishi Sunak on the economy because what they found from their own, like, focus group polling is that... And I can well believe it. I've been saying as much in my videos, but I haven't had any evidence. What The way Sunak's behaving is irritating to people because he keeps going on, oh... I'm doing really well with the economy. People don't feel that he's doing really well with the economy. I mean, he's not. He's objectively not. But he's got enough data that he can hoodwink people if things were going all right for them. But they're not. People know that they're struggling. Like, if you're getting by and you can afford, you know, to get your groceries and, you can, and you're not having to pay too much attention to what things are costing and you can go on your holiday and you can get your new car every however many years you get your new car. For some people, it's every year they get a new car. But whatever, you've had this standard of living. As long as that standard of living is maintained, your real terms income can go down. And a lot of people actually, when it comes to it, don't notice. They don't really notice. Because a lot of people aren't really saving that much. They're more just spending it on things they don't need if they've got excess. So they don't notice when real terms pay cuts are coming. But when they're struggling... When they're having to look at their finances in more carefully because they're now having to cut back on things, then they notice. They're forced to notice. So they notice that things are getting worse when Rishi Sunak thinks, says things are getting better. And Labour have identified that that is irritating people. And it's irritating target voters. So they're going to go for that this, this autumn. Um, but anyway, I'll go, to the, I'll go on to some of the Ipsos Mori ones just to... Um, show what some of them have got. So first of all, so I, I keep saying sort of like sheep, uh, people are sheeple. When it comes to an election, perception is everything. It, it, it'd be lovely to think that people go into an election and they consider the various options and they tick the box that they think is going to be the best one, right? But that's not how it works in so many cases. There are a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of people who just vote for the same, I mean, I do, you know, you just vote for the same party. But I mean, of swing voters. There are a lot of voters who are who just go with the herd. They go with the crowd. So if they get the feeling that the country wants this change of government, well, they sort of do as well. So when you've got things like most of the population thinking that Keir Starmer is going to be the next prime minister, that Labour are going to form the next government, it sort of creates a mindset that tends that way. So... You know, and you can see it's just been increasing over the last year. So now 56, was that 56 or 50? I think it's 56%. think it's very likely it is that Keir Starmer will become Prime Minister. Only 28% think unlikely. So that's basically your Conservative and Reform UK voters. Um, you know, so, and, and again, the trend over time. But then let's look at the head-to-head. -head. Oh, I'll, I'll do this comment first because this has just caught my eye. Uh, Daniel saying, my dad is convinced the Tories will win the next election. He constantly references Neil Kinnock in 92. I've got no idea what magic rabbit uh, the cons will part the hats. Any idea for? There is, ab I do know that Labour are worried about 1992 as well. There is zero things in common. I'll tell you what happened in 1992. First of all, the Conservatives had a really unpopular leader and they just got rid of, they've just got rid of her for John Major. So got rid of Thatcher for John Major and he hadn't been in the job long enough to shit the bed yet, right? And he was seen as credible. Now, you could think to yourself, well, haven't we just done the same with Boris Johnson and got Rishi Sunak in, in time? Yes, but, but Rishi Sunak is not, does not seem credible. The other thing is, Neil Kinnock, unfortunately, is a very fine politician in many ways, but it's just that personality thing. He said himself in a recent interview, he was Marmite. You know, it's a bit like in modern terms, you might say like Angela Rayner is really popular with some people, but a lot of other people didn't like him. And it was purely it was nothing to do with the way he was. It was entirely just to it was just um, 
subjective reaction. And that's all it was. Um, I don't think it's because they're both ginger either, by the way. But that, you know, there was, you know, Neil Kinnock himself said that was, unfortunately, that was just it. There were just some people who couldn't warm to him as prime minister and couldn't see him, couldn't take him seriously as prime minister. Um, whereas John Major didn't really offend people in the same way. So, and, and this, and, but Keir Starmer, it's like, he's not Marmite. That's the thing. No one's really offended by, in terms of swing voters, no one's offended by Keir Starmer's manner. Um, you know, they can't find a reason to dislike him or to, or to think that he won't be a competent prime minister. Uh, there's, there's nothing. And also in 1992, you know, they were, we were recovering. There was an economic recovery underway. There is no economic recovery underway at the moment. Nothing, not a thing that, is, that was the case in 1992 is the case now. Absolutely nothing. Uh, you say, John Major was far from popular, um, far more popular than his party. Yes, indeed. Well, arguably, Rishi Sunak still is. Rishi Sunak's popularity has gone down, but he's still something of an asset. But it's nowhere near enough to rescue the party. Um, I mean, even the sleaze, like the sleaze emerged over the following parliament. You didn't really talk about Tory sleaze in 92 that I remember. Bear, I mean, bear in mind, I was a teenager at the time. Um, how old would I have been? About 16. So, you know, I was, I was politically interested, but I wouldn't have been as aware as I am now. But I, I didn't really feel that there was like talk of Tory sleaze. Um, but you know, 97, but there is now and way worse than there was in 97. This is much, much, much more like 97. Everything's broken. All the public services are broken. Everything's knackered. Uh, the leader has, you know, no confidence. Like he's, he's telling people to sit tight, ride it out, you know, face up to it when they're looking it's easy for you mate you're you're bloody rich um that doesn't help him his wealth doesn't help him when he's it wouldn't ordinarily matter but when he's telling people to sit tight when they can't afford the bills then it matters but anyway let's have a little look at the head-to-head because -head. sunak does actually win out on one of them and it's sort of understandable which one so if we go down the list uh so and this is a comparison saying this applies to each of them. Uh, and it, they, but the person for this, I think, could have ticked both as well. So in terms of paying attention to detail, actually, the general population, both, I mean, a minority in both cases, but they both think uh, Starmer and Sunak are equal on that one. Uh, quite remarkable that people can think, even 37% of people can think, that Rishi Sunak uh, has, an atten has attention to detail. Uh, I can understand it more of Starmer because he's not been tested, has he? As far as they're concerned, I mean, he's been tested in his earlier career. But as far as they're concerned, he's not been tested. Um, next one, capable leader. Uh, Starmer leads by plus three because 37% think he's a capable leader. Only 33% think Sunak is. They understand the problems facing Britain. 47 So Starmer's got a 15-point lead here. 47% think yes. Only 32% think Sunak does. Good in a crisis. Now, this is the one Sunak leads. And again, you can understand why, because again, as far as the public's concerned, they haven't seen Keir Starmer in a crisis. You know, he will have had crises to deal with in his professional career, but they haven't seen it. It's not been public. So whereas Sunak was the chancellor who dealt, for example, with furlough. So some people will still remember that. So that's fine and that's understandable. They're an honest person. 29% think Sunak, 38 Starmer. So Starmer has a lead of nine there. I trust them to get the big decisions right. 26% uh, for Sunak, 31 for Starmer. So five point lead for Starmer. They're a strong leader, six point lead for Starmer. Um, they have a lot of personality. Now, neither of them have a personality, let's be honest. Um, but Or at least in terms of, I, I keep saying, I don't know what they're like on an individual basis. They may be fine you know, to have a drink with or something. But in terms of that charisma that reaches across a camera, they're both crap. Um, but actually, Sunak apparently has a one-point lead there, uh, remarkably. Uh, they are an experienced leader, 29% Sunak, 37 for Starmer. 
And I wonder if that is because of his time as director of public prosecutions, or is it just because he's been the political leader for longer? I wonder. Interesting. But that's a hefty lead. Because that so that that basically means they're not seeing Sunak as experience, which actually makes his er, he made the, I, I did a video, didn't I, a week or so ago, that Sunak was basically saying, "Oh, I'm not very experienced in this job," as if it was an excuse. And I thought, what a ridiculous thing to say. How is that going to give people? How is that going to make people confident that you can get them through this if you're going? Oh, I don't really know what I'm doing. Um. They're going to make the country a better place. 23% think Sunak. That's fewer than, than intend to vote Conservative. Uh, 29 for Starmer. So, I mean, it's not a big number for Starmer, really. But, you know, it is a lead. A lead is a lead. Um, they share my values. Starmer has a nine-point lead on that. And then they are in touch with ordinary people. Starmer has a 20-point lead on this. Now, and, and I'll go through, before I come to this last one, why it's important as well, because you may think, well, it's not exactly a majority in either case. I mean, the, by far and away, the best one is Keir Starmer's 47% for understanding the problems facing Britain, right? The reason it's important is because, you know, 30, about 30 million, 32, is it? Around, just over 30 million, I think, tend to go to a vote in a general election, right? Over the last few general elections. And... Most of them are just going to vote. They've already decided how they're going to vote, and that's all there is to it. The ones who matter is really just a few hundred thousand swing voters. Those swing voters are voting pragmatically. They may not be voting intelligently. They may not be well-informed enough or have enough critical thinking skills, but they, in their own minds, are voting pragmatically. And, and they'll be thinking to themselves, between Labour and the Conservatives, because they know it's one of those two for government, and they'll think to themselves, which one is better? And part of that calculation is the leader. It's incredibly important that you go into the election with your leader in a head-to-head -head with the other leader winning. So, I mean, this was the madness of Labour in 2019. Uh, Boris Johnson was not popular. You know, people say at the moment, well, Keir Starmer's not exactly popular in the country. It's like, He's way more popular than Rishi Sunak, though, and that is what matters. Because people aren't voting. Like I always say, democracy is not, it's not about what you want, it's about what you least oppose. But there's a lot, the key swing voters, the ones who actually do swing elections, they're of the same opinion. You know, they're voting pragmatically for not necessarily the best, as they, the least worst, sometimes, is how they may see it. So when you've got, like, Starmer beating Sunak like this, Absolutely immense. I mean, the Labour Party, when whenever people poll the Labour's, Labour against the Conservatives, the Labour, Labour always win out. The, the Labour Party are in a dominant position now. In terms of the political leaders, that is where Sunak did have a chance to overhaul Starmer, because Starmer is being very cautious. Of course, it could be argued if Sunak wasn't making it so easy for him, he, he, he would of necessity be less cautious, we would see. Um but, you know, so this is this is why it's important. But I'll just do that last one. They're in touch with ordinary people. Starmer, 20 point lead, right? You can bet your and that is important as well. That is important for like for some reason, these posh privileged people like Nigel Farage and Boris Johnson, somehow ordinary working people thought that they were on their wavelength. Right. Goodness knows how. It's a superb con trick. Right. Absolutely superb contract. But that's what they thought. They're not going to think that of Sunak. Sunak is really bad at pulling that. And when it comes to the general election campaign, I will tell you something. It will come as no surprise to anyone here, I suspect. Labour will be dusting... You know that clip of, from last year, Rishi Sunak, when it emerged last year, where he was boasting to some Conservatives that, oh, yeah, I took a load of money from poor areas, deprived areas, and gave it to rich areas like you. That sort of thing, it'll be coming back. Also, the clip from when he was a teenager. Oh, I've got all these posh friends. I've got working class friends. Oh, no, obviously not working class friends. Sorry, I didn't mean that. That'll be back as well. Because it is a stick to beat him with. And he has no effective uh, thing there. Uh, question about Absanity is saying, 22% say they share values, but only 17% say he's in touch with ordinary people. 5% think they're special. Well, people do. 
You do sometimes get some funny aberrations like that when you look at polling, uh, indeed. Uh, but it is what it is. Uh, but the important, it is always really important that the, you know, if you're backing either the Conservatives or Labour, that your leader wins the head-to-head. -head. There's multiple head-to-heads you need. Obviously, you need the party head-to-head. -head. Then there's the leader. Then there's the Chancellor. And I'll, I'll have to tell you, they don't do it very often, but Jeremy Hunt is deeply unpopular. Uh, Rachel Reeves absolutely, you know, may not be super popular herself again either because not a lot of people necessarily know her, but um, way more popular than Jeremy Hunt. Um, but there we go. Just checking for a couple more comments before we go to the next one. Uh, Sonak is facing fresh conflict of interest rather India trade deal concerning his wife again. Yeah, but I mean, all of these, we know nothing really happens. Of course, there's going to be a conflict of interest. His father-in-law is one of the richest billionaires in India. When he goes to visit Modi, he'll be meeting with his father-in-law. His father-in-law will meet President Modi all the time. One of the richest billionaires, of course he will. Um, I mean, I said in my video on that India trade deal, which, you know, will only happen if Rishi Sunak backs down on pretty much everything, which he may do. Because, again, it, it seems more and more likely to me that Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister just to, like, get in good with his father-in-law. You know, because his wife really may well be inheriting that fortune and he wants to be in amongst it, doesn't he? It's pure greed. Pure greed. So I absolutely can believe he will sell us out with a crap trade deal. Um, and that what he's really fighting for is not the UK's interest, but his family's in his, 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 the family he married into, their interest. Um, I just hope it can't go through before the election, but I, I mean, it can do if he folds on everything. But there it is. All right, next one then. So interesting on Sunak trends. I'm going to have to, um, hang on, I'm just going to make it larger for myself. Because unfortunately, this particular graphic, this is the best quality one I could get. Um, I don't know why I couldn't get a higher res one, but there you go. Um, so this is showing Rishi Sunak over time. So it starts on the left-hand side is November 2022. He'd only just become prime minister all the way to the right. So in terms of, so this shows the trends. So what I've just shown you there was a snapshot, but is it going up or is it going down? Is he gaining the confidence of the public or is he losing it? So in terms of understanding the problems facing GB, losing it. He's gone from 46% to 32%. Um, he's an honest person, stayed about the same. Started at 30%, now 29%. He's good in a crisis, actually seems to have increased, bizarrely, from 27% to 30%. He's a strong leader, gone down. How could it not? I mean, I'm surprised it's not gone down further because since he's become prime minister... He's, he has shown weak leadership quite a lot of the time. And Labour have actually managed to point out a lot of times when he's been weak. Uh, capable leader gone down from 41% to 33%. In touch with ordinary people, it's gone down a little bit, sort of pretty static from 19 to 17%. Going to make the country a better place, 27% to 23%. So that's in the wrong direction for him. He pays attention to detail. 47% down to 37%. So people are becoming less impressed with him. Uh, has a lot of personality from 30 to 26. Gone down. Um, I trust him to get the big decisions right. That has gone down. He shares my values. Actually, that's gone up somehow. Somehow that has gone up. <laughs> I don't know how. Um, but it's still very low. Experienced leader. I mean, that's I had, that's gone up a little bit doesn't surprise me inevitably because he is a more experienced leader he's been prime minister for like what 10 months nine ten months now so inevitably he's a bit more there uh s fact saying there will rachel Rees become the first female chance well chancellor as you said there but chancellor of the exchequer yes we haven't had a female chancellor of the exchequer indeed i think it is let me think yes it is it's the last big office of state that hasn't had a uh, female representation chancellor. So we've had female prime ministers, of course. We've had female home and foreign secretaries um, quite recently, in fact. We've had all of those things last year, for example. Liz Truss was the foreign secretary. Um, we've had others as well. But I mean, in the last year, you know, Liz Truss was foreign secretary. 
then she became prime minister then um and now you know and then and now we've had female home secretaries in fact you know grant shapps was a, a male home secretary for like six days <laughs> um but since then it's been a while since we've had a, a male home secretary so yeah the last one is uh is chancellor uh, in terms of the, the the big officers of state indeed um and I'm saying it'd be good to see Starmer and Sonic head to head in leader debates. More than six questions, gloves off, and can say things the speaker wouldn't allow. Or will Sonic dip out of debates? So, yeah, I do get this question a lot. It's quite understandable for people to think he may duck out because Boris Johnson avoided quite a few of them. I don't think he can duck out. If he does, it will be bad for him. He'll have to go to them. Uh, and the reason why, and the reason why Boris Johnson got away with it, Boris Johnson went into that general election in 2019. He was ahead of... The, the Conservatives were ahead of Labour in the polls. And he personally was ahead of Jeremy Corbyn in the head-to-head, -head, right? So the Conservatives were default winners. They just had to make sure that they maintained it. It was a bit like uh, when South Africa first won the Rugby Union World Cup. You know, they got a bit of a lead and then they held it. They defended it, parked the bus, so to speak. Um, same sort of thing here. Whereas into the next general election, Rishi Sunak, unless something quite spectacular happens, is going to go into that election behind. He's going to... The Conservatives are going to be behind Labour. He is going to be behind Starmer in the head-to-head. -head. Again, unless there's some footage emerges of Keir Starmer eating puppies for breakfast or something, you know, they... That is the situation. So Rishi Sunak cannot play a defensive game. I mean, imagine a football team or a rugby team being 10 points behind or, or three goals behind and parking the bus. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> you, you're losing. <laughs> you need to actually do something. So, no. Um, if he dodges the debates for fear of making things worse, that'll be all to Labour's good. Uh, it won't help him to dodge them. You could argue it helped Boris Johnson to dodge them because he was already the default winner. He just had to not put his foot in it too many times. So, of course, he reduced the number of uh, opportunities to put his foot in it. Sonak can't afford to. Um, uh, when it comes to values, you can connect that with the woke wars. You could, yes. Yeah, if there's people getting on board with the, the culture wars, you can absolutely uh, say that you know, you think Rishi Sunak shares your values because he stands on a particular, even if it's a very niche stance. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Stam is untested in debates and has the personality charisma of a second-hand wardrobe left outside for too long. He's not untested in debates, though, is he? Is he? Because what did he do before he became an MP? He was the country's top prosecutor, wasn't he? He is incredibly uh, experienced in debates. In fact, one of the things when... Keir Starmer became Labour leader that we could absolutely take for granted is that he will... At the time, he was up against Boris Johnson. It made no difference. He will absolutely stitch up whoever's against him because he is used to... He has years of experience in making arguments that put people behind bars. Never mind, look silly on telly. So, no, Keir Starmer absolutely has bags of experience. Uh, let's just hope Stammer doesn't accept a free meal from a Samsung wreck in South Korea. Who cares? Um, so it looks like Sunak is going to duck the UN General Assembly. That's not going to help. There's, there's been a, it's been a bit funny when it's come to international engagements. He's like gone to some and then not others. Um, but I mean, that's probably fairly small fry. I mean, it may, it may even just be that he's got too many fires to put out here. Because that's another thing. Even if, like, you could almost imagine that if, let's say, Rishi Sunak did have a coherent plan, it it's going to constantly be derailed by his own party. But I don't think he did. Like, I, you know, I say this summer, I put in the, the thumbnail, Summer of Chaos. If you look at this summer, for example, we've had about four weeks of it now, summer recess. So the first week was just nothing really happened. He went on holiday. Others went on holiday as well. So, you know, nothing really happened. Then the second week, it was there. Do you remember their asylum week? They, so, and I was saying at the time, Labour should do something like this because 
The political journalists are desperate for news. They'll report anything, right? They will report anything. If Larry the cat looked a bit sick, they'll report on that. So Keir Starmer could have been like making big speeches or other members of the shadow cabinet when he was on holiday. And you're just like, you know, why weren't Labour doing it? And I, I thought to myself, maybe they just wanted the Tories to make asses of themselves because the Tories had this big asylum week, right? And it ended in disaster. Then they decided to do NHS week. I said at the time, before they'd even started it, what are they thinking? What, what are they thinking? That was obviously, I mean, it wasn't a disaster because a hospital didn't fall down or anything, but um, I mean, it wasn't good. It didn't do them any good. And, and, and then this last week, it's like, well, what? there wasn't anything again. And, it, and I think to myself, so hang on a minute. I don't believe that they planned to do, I can believe the first week nothing because, you know, go on holiday, re recharge your batteries, then come back. So you have a one week focus on asylum, second week focus on healthcare. You're not just going to do that, are you? That doesn't make sense. You would have a third week where you focus on another policy area. I mean, why not the economy or something? Um, and then a fourth week on something else. That, that surely was the plan. There was going to be a summer where each week was a focus on a different area to try and get public support back. Now, one of two things must be the case. Either that was their plan and they abandoned it because the asylum week was so bad and the NHS week was a flop. So they just thought, actually, we're just hurting ourselves here. And Labour are laughing. That's probably not a good sign. Or they didn't think any further ahead. They just thought to themselves, oh, we should have a different policy uh, each week. Oh, good idea. We'll, we'll start off with asylum. Oh, yeah, we're strong on asylum, which obviously they're not. Uh, and then we'll do the NHS. Oh, yeah, that's important. Yeah, we'll do the NHS. Um, and then what should we do in the third week? Oh, we'll worry about that later. So it's one or the other. Absolute. You know, I can't believe that they only intended to do two weeks of like focus on two different policy areas. That doesn't make sense. So as far as I'm concerned, either they just don't know. I mean, it's obvious they don't know what they're doing, but I mean, literally, they, they, they're not coming up with coherent plans, even if they're bad ones. Or they keep having to cancel them because their own side keeps messing it up. It's got to be one of those two things. Um, uh, Tories seem to spend more time bashing Sadiq Khan than Keir Starmer. Uh, well, that's because they've got their eyes, first of all, on the mayoral elections next year. Let me see. Um, although they have backed the, I, I mean, I don't really know details about the candidates and Susan Hall is their, is their candidate now. But I got the impression that even Conservatives think they started off with a strong feel that they had some decent candidates and they ended up somehow with the, with the worst of them. So I don't know how they managed that. But, you know, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, you say Starmer lost a personality contest to Liz Truss. How did he? How did he? On what basis would you say that? Um, as an MP, Stan will always have an advantage in debates due to his legal background. Lots of barristers have become good MPs, exception being Geoffrey Howard. Well, well, indeed, but it is, it is a, it's a profession where your the strength of your argument is what makes you, and like, just a struggling barrister or solicitor or someone who can command salaries of millions a year. Didn't they do a bit of education stuff? No, we just happened to have results come out. <laughs> you know, they didn't. Like Gillian Keegan said a thing and then hid back in her hole because it was the stupid thing to say. But no, they didn't do a bit of education stuff. They didn't announce any education policies. They just said a thing because some results were coming out. That happens every year. Is there anything Sunak can say which could trip up Starmer? Um, he, the thing is, he doesn't need to trip up Starmer because he's the one in government. What Sunak needs to do is to, if, right, it's really, this, like, it doesn't matter how appealing Keir Starmer's offer is to the public. If Rishi Sunak had the confidence of the public that he was managing things all right, people get worried about, you know, it's more like, you know, the saying, it's better the devil you know. 
some people get a bit worried about a change of government because it's a step into the unknown. So it doesn't matter how good the opposition are. If the, if the, the current government people think, well, they're all right. What, and what, we, you know, what we're getting sounds like it might be all right, but it might not. You know, so all Sonak had to do was make people feel that he was making their lives better. And he had the option to do that. And then it would have been a real fight. Labour would have had a real fight going to the next election. And we may well have been in hung parliament territory. Or the Conservatives may well have nicked it. And it was so easy. All they had to do was stop being Tories for one year. Like, they had 13 years of crap government. 13 years of destroying everything. All they had to do was say, right, for one year, let's just govern. And, and i give you specific proposals for it. They could, I've said these before, there's nothing secret about them. Apply windfall taxes, proper windfall taxes to oil and gas companies to have kept the crap cost of energy low. That would have also kept inflation low, which would have stopped the interest rates going up as high as they did. That one thing would have made a massive difference. You know, they could have just decided to properly fund uh, public services for a year. Just met, just show that things are getting better. They would have turned the tap off immediately after the election. All they had to do for one year was just actually show things getting better. Not fixed. They wouldn't have fi you can't fix it in a year. It's impossible, even if they wanted to. They wouldn't have fixed anything. They'd have just shown it was getting better. Then what would have happened is a load of voters would have gone, OK, they broke it, but actually that was others. That wasn't Rishi Sunak. Rishi Sunak seems to be fixing it. They had that opportunity for Rishi Sunak to be looking like he was fixing things. Fixing things with the NHS, fixing things with the cost of living, fixing things with housing. Huge issue. And he hasn't. And, and then people would have thought, you know, yeah, well, Labour, yeah, maybe we do need, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure about Labour's plans. Because no one's sure about Labour's plans. Because most people are experts. You can't be an expert in housing and the economy and industrial strategy and healthcare and education and all of these things. Ordinary voters can't be experts. Most ordinary voters aren't experts in any of those things. So you can't really judge someone's plans, political plans and policies to see whether they'll be any good or not. So you're sort of acting on faith. But he didn't. Rishi Sunak, you know, thought, I'll just carry on taking the piss and I'll just smile with a bag of tea. I'll just, I'll just talk about Yorkshire tea. That'll do it. I mean, Boris Johnson held up a kipper, for goodness sake. I'll just hold up a tea bag. Does the same thing, doesn't it? Um... I think Sonat will be at a disadvantage against Starmer because his emotions keep coming to the surface. Yeah, he's very, he's very petulant. Yeah, very much like Boris Johnson. Again, it's probably just sim It's just their background, isn't it? Like, at the end of the day, they don't like... I, it may be they just don't like it when, when people in general tell them that they're wrong, but they really don't like it when an oik tells them they're wrong. You know, someone from, like, a working-class background, they don't like it. You know, he... he, 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 he he's, he's, his dad was a tool maker. His mum was a nurse. What does he think he's doing telling me, telling me I'm wrong? You know. Um, the Tory argument in 97 was the country shouldn't elect Labour because they were untested in government. The public had had enough in the forthcoming election would be likewise. Absolutely, yeah. And, and, and it does, it, it is powerful, this argument about, well, you don't really know what you're getting. Because it's, it's true. Uh, so, you know, you're, the change of government comes when people basically say, it's a bit like the Tory party when they got rid of Boris Johnson. You know, at, at the start of last year, 2022, it was obvious Johnson had to go. But there were Tory MPs, you know, saying, we need to get rid of him. The other Tory MPs going, with who? It's all right saying get rid of him. Who do you replace him with? And it just got to the point last summer where even, where those... You know, the same conversation was happening. People going, we need to get rid of him. And, the, the, you know, people go, well, with who? Who do we get rid of him for? And, and the answer came back, anyone. I don't care. Just get rid of him. And the same thing happens with the public and the, uh, and the government. There comes a point 
where, you know, the argument about, you know, well, you don't really know what you're getting, who, you know, what are you replacing us with, what are you replacing with? There comes a point where the public just go, we don't care. It can't be worse than this. And now, when it came to the Tories, of course, it could be worse than that. Trust was actually worse than Boris Johnson. That was quite remarkable. It was quite remarkable um, that, you know, there's multiple remarkable things about the last three prime ministers. The first is that Boris Johnson was not... You know, he was basically, probably fair to say, the wor certainly one of the worst, if not the worst, prime minister this country's ever had. And then he ended up not even being the worst prime minister we had last year. That was remarkable. Um, and then you think to yourself, we've had, in the last year, three prime ministers. Because this time last year, Boris Johnson was still prime minister. So we've had three prime ministers in the last year. And Rishi Sunak is actually the best of them. He's actually, like, the best. He's the third worst. And, and he's terrible. But, you know, there it is. I mean, that, I'll, I'll come to that when we, you know, the Nadine Doris letter, again, for those who haven't read it yet. You know, she, she's really slagging Rishi Sunak off and attacking his government. And it's thinking, but everything you're... And it's like, some of the things she's attacking his government for are true. They're valid. But they were also true when she was in government. And they were especially true of her department when she was running it. Uh, but anyway, uh, if my internet gets worse than these carry projects, why is it struggling a little bit? I have got the note down there. I'm afraid they were supposed to come and fix my fibre last week and then did not do. So now it's supposed to be next week. Who knows? Uh, I, I just hate, hate all... I, I'll go off on a, an anti-privatisation rant if I carry on down that now. But there we go. Um... Uh, was it Disraeli who said they don't vote governments in, they vote them out? Well, it is both. I think there, 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 some, you know, some people will think that you just have to sit back and wait for the government to lose. You can't do that either. Um, like the government were also unpopular in 2019. I mean, for goodness sake, like there were, I keep saying they did it in winter, the NHS winter crisis. This was pre-COVID pre and yet it was still, the NHS was breaking then. You know, there were there were reports, there were front page news reports of patients in corridors, not even on trolleys, on the floor because they'd run out of trolleys for people needing emergency care. And the Conservatives should never have been able to win under those circumstances. It was because so the, the opposition do have to win it. The opposition do have to win it. You can't allow yourself to think you just have to wait for the government to lose the, People are, people are making that decision which is the better of them. It's just that it is essential that the, the government have lost the public confidence. Otherwise, they'll carry on voting for that government because it'll just be like, yeah, but we don't know what we're getting with the others. So, yeah. Uh, you say Sonak's not the best of the last three Tories, he's just the least dreadful. Well, it's the same thing. It's all relative. All relative. Right, anyway, there was that one. What else did I have? Oh, I did have another little graphic. It's not all that important. Um, but just showing favourability uh, for different parties. But obviously the big, the most important one is between Labour and the Conservatives. Because again, it's about target voters, swing voters, and the swing voters basically vote either Conservative or Labour. They may vote tactically. I mean, we're expecting a lot of tactical... That's another thing that people need to bear in mind. Come the next election, there will be a lot of anti-Tory tactical voting going on, just like there was in 97. Um, but yeah, Labour Party net favourability of plus four, Conservative Party minus 30. And ref again, reform, I mean, this is Ipsos Mori, remember, reform, and they don't over, they don't inflate things for Reform UK, minus 31. They're both arseholes. And people know that. Uh, I was watching on the Abra Social while chopping out as if I had dial up. Yeah, it's abs oh, it's I we absolutely hate it. We've I've got two internet things. They're both rubbish. We are actually replacing one of them, but the fiber one we can't replace because that's the thing. When they were telling me on the phone, oh yeah, we we because the engineer was supposed to turn up last Wednesday and they were basically telling me, yeah, they didn't. It's our fault. It's completely our cock up. How are you going to fix it? We're not. We're just going to book another engineer. That's what I was told. That's what I was told. This, you know, the person on the phone said, 
I can escalate it. And I said, do escalate. He said, I can escalate it. Because I was saying, I get how that person on the phone couldn't prioritise this because it was their negligence that meant I was without internet for weeks. But he could escalate it to someone who could. And he said, I can do it, but they won't do it. And the reason they won't do it, the reason they won't do it is because there's no competition. You know, the Tories go about, oh, privatisation, you'll get a good service because of competition. No. Where, sometimes there is such a thing as competition. Usually for like luxury items or, or food, you know, like groceries, there is actually genuine competition there. For most people anyway. As long as you can actually travel a bit, whether it's on the bus car or whatever, as long as you can get to multiple shops or supermarkets, there is genuine competition there. But for something like broad, there's nothing Fiber, I've got one company. And they know it as well. They know it. That is why they can... Because otherwise, they know full well. If they'd have spoken to me like that and there was anyone else I could go with, I would say, well, stick your internet up where the sun don't shine. Um, but there it is. But, you know, and that is the problem because they talk about, you know, when you try and pin a Tory down, well, how does privatising help? Who's the competition you see? Multiple providers. We don't have multiple providers. Your postcode determines your provider. For internet, in theory, you know, you think, oh, well, there's different providers here. Yeah, but it's the same line, isn't it? It's the same line. There might be some providers who, are, who deliver a better service, as in customer service, but it's all the same. You're not, you know, gas, you can go for a different company for your gas and electricity. It's the same. It's coming from the same place. It's going down the same pipes. Water, that's set, you know, set hard with all the sewage in it, I should think. Everything's just set. Like, even the trains, I was getting myself some... Tra These are my train tickets for London for the Rejoin EU March, 23rd of September. Um, LNER, I went with those purely because they are the ones... Where the actual tickets have fallen. I don't want to lose those. They are the ones who had a train going from the place I need to get it to the place I need to go to at roughly the time I needed to get there. It's no competition. <laughs> Not at all. It's like, do you want a train? Yeah, I want a train to get from here to here at this time. Right, well, this is your train. Can I choose a different train? No, that's the train, you idiot. It's on a railway line. So there's no competition at all. Uh, do I have business internet or residential? Well... It's, it is residential. I mean, I actually told them what it was for and that it, it is for a business, but they gave me what it is anyway. So it, because it's a residential property, they gave me, gave me that. Um, but it makes no difference. There's absolutely no reason why when there's a serious fault that it should fix it because I'd, I'd made it incredibly clear that it's, I have an internet business, basically. They don't care. They don't give a shit. They know I'm not going to cancel it. Because what am I going to do? Stick with my... Cra Th this is my crappy copper thing. It's absolutely appalling. You know, when for, even for something like uploading a video, I now have to allow a good two hours to upload the video. I'm not saying it always takes two hours, but I have to allow two hours. So I can't mess about doing something really up to the last minute. Whereas with fibre, I have to still allow time for processing. That's at YouTube's end. But that's like 15 minutes max. You know, if I, I can upload a video with the fiber when it's working, and by the time I've typed, you know, you just, as you can understand, you type in the title, you type in the description, a few tags, things like that. So it takes you like a few minutes to do, to, to, to do the admin. So, so it's uploaded, it's done, it's finished, ready. Uh, claim my studio's office, ask for business internet from Virgin. Uh, no, don't, 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 don't supply it here. They don't supply it. Um, but, it, you know, anyway, it doesn't. It just needs to work. There's no reason for it not to work. The reason it doesn't work is just because they don't make, like, technology. There is no, oh, well, these, these complicated technologies. No, it's not. Could you imagine? Like, there was a time in the 70s when, like, phone, you might get disconnected off your phone, when we had manual operators. It was someone physically taking a, thing out and sticking it somewhere else right as soon as we got automatic you, you like there was a bit in the 80s i suppose as well but into the 90s you didn't you used a phone and you would reliably use a phone 
you didn't get cut off. If someone hung up at the other end, that's different. But the actual phone line was reliable. There's no reason for internet. Internet is no different to a phone line. It's just carrying more data. There's no reason for an internet connection to fail unless there's been like mechanical damage to the line somewhere. Whatever you do, don't use talk talk. Well, we don't. We're in fact. So what? What I'm actually doing? KCAR. I'm stuck with. They are my only fibre provider, so I'm stuck with them. We are changing the sky to BT. BT, are ju everyone's just as bad, by the way. I know everyone's just as bad. I've experienced them all. They're all terrible. NTL used to be okay. They were taken over by... In fact, NTL used to be good. They were taken over by Virgin who became okay. There's no Virgin here. Um, so it is what it is. But at least the BT one comes with a backup mobile EE thing. So if that goes tits up, I will at least have the backup EE mobile data. Um, so there'll effectively be like three sources of internet coming into the house, really, which is, you know, I should be able to get something then. Uh, where I live in rural France, fibre is due to be rolled out in 2029, uh, due to be, yeah. Well, I mean, here it's, like uh, I don't even know if, like, the reason we don't have decent internet in this country is it's because of the Conservatives. Labour, you could argue, in their 13 years of power, really should have got serious about it, and they should have done. Gordon Brown was going to in 2010, but that was too bloody late, wasn't it? Lost the pissing election. Uh, in fact, maybe Keir Starmer's not going to say anything about internet because Labour have now promised two um, like serious rollouts of broadband in this country and lost elections both times. So maybe it's a bit of a jinx for Labour. Maybe they're just going to do it and not say it. Uh, that's what I'm hoping anyway. EE, powered by Kevin Bacon. Yeah, well, I, I trust Kevin Bacon more than the average Tory, so that's fine. Um, uh, also, I don't actually think there's, there's any... I don't think 5G is even available in my area anyway for that. I was actually thinking of just a, purely as a backup, getting a, just an actual mobile data thing as well. You have to be quite careful. I did try it a couple of years ago with Vodafone, but there's no coverage with Vodafone here. It's crap. Um, so we have, yeah. Uh, if there's high demand from an area, Virgin will install it. I have gigabyte line. Only pay for 500 meg speed. Double for free as I'm also an O2 customer. They merged with Virgin. Oh, did they? I didn't know that. See, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm not, it's not quite true to say I'm out in the sticks, but it is, because it, it, it's a town. But like, if I say it's a town with no supermarket, it's, it's you know, it's not a main residential area. It's sort of like, like it's an old market town. So it is technically a town. It's quite a small one. But it, as I say, it doesn't have a supermarket. Like the village I grew up had two supermarkets, just for comparison there. So, yeah, there's never... We've only just had any form of fibre here. KCOM just installed it. But apparently, because we're not in... They're based in Hull. If I was a customer in Hull, apparently I could have an engineer within 48 hours. But because I'm not... Sorry, you're waiting about a month. Is that all right? No. Oh, what are you going to do about it? Nothing. Because I can't get anyone else. Um, Virgin Energy is to turn down the signal to other households when they connect to someone else locally. Twice my oh the old DAX boxes were a were a thing uh, when broadband was first being rolled out in this country. Certainly, yeah, you know every time someone else got connected to your street, your own internet got worse. Yeah, it, oh, the whole thing's a terrible fiddle, huge fiddle. But when it's fiber, it's not really such a big issue. Um, but you know we we need. I mean the thing is as well, it it's like I'm complaining about it. But, you know, and it does affect my business. But you think about all the businesses that really need it. Like, you know, people that were watching me on Later Be Social last night. And you look at that. Imagine that was me trying to talk to a customer. And that kept happening. That's not good. You know, it's actually very damaging for business. Like, it should be an economic imperative that we get good quality, reliable fibre broadband throughout this country. You know, it would... I don't actually know how much it would cost for the for the state to do this. But it would be a huge boost to the economy, wouldn't it? 
to actually have reliable internet. But anyway, right, I've come to the end there, and I've got moaning, moaning about privatisation. Bloody annoying. Uh, Uncle Social say, I've mentioned before that following every privatisation in the UK, our services have become the worst in Western Europe. Yes, every nothing works, and every time, you know, it, it, but this is, the media don't do this. They don't sit these conservatives down and really hammer them on. You know, well, look up, look at this service then. How can you say that privatisation isn't what NACA did? You know, they just come up with spurious arguments or spurious defences. Oh, is the competition. We don't have competition. There is no competition. There's a load of monopolists involved in it. It's all right looking at this great long list of different providers for internet. They're all, there's two, there's two providers. There's your local fiber. If you live in a, like, I gather it's quite good in, I mean, that's probably why a lot of people don't understand because like London, I gather it's decent. I suppose in like in cities in general, it's more likely to be good than not. And that's where most people live. So it's like in cities, it's likely to be quite reliable. In a, in a town, it's maybe not bad. It's places like where I am, where it's absolutely god awful. Uh, did Labour renationalise when in power? Renationalise what? They didn't renationalise anything, of course not. But you can't, again, you know, when you say renationalise, how do you do it? You can't do it by just paying off shareholders because all that happens then, you lose the next election and the Conservatives give it back again. That is not how you, that's not nationalisation. That is bringing the Tories back in sooner rather than later. That's what that is. Nationalisation is when you can do it for next to no cost, preferably no cost at all, which is what we'll be doing with trains explicitly and implicitly water as well as energy. But there it is. But anyway, uh, run out of time there. Brian saying just last one then. Screw good quality broadband. What about good quality water, even drinkable water? Um, yeah, well, we, we can have both, you know, we can have all of these things, in fact. It's not like the technology is just behind the curve. We've got the technology is years old. Fibre technology is years old. I mean, I had it 20 years ago. Is it, in fact, I think it was over 20 years ago when I first got fibre. It should be everywhere now. And it should be reliable. But anyway, but we can have both and we can have everything else as well. Uh, it's only it's only Tories cost another but there we go we'll leave it there before I carry on with another rant uh, thanks very much for coming on everyone uh, have a good evening and I shall be back on tomorrow with a Nadine Doris video probably the first one because her letter was absolutely hilarious and I recommend reading it unless you're a conservative supporter in which case I recommend not reading it because it's absolutely dreadful uh, but have a good evening until next time and I'll see you later